you know, there's a famous Monty Python line, now for something completely different. This isn't quite that much of a pivot, but it will be different in flavor. Um, you know, one of the advantages of, well, pick up on Jonas's line about following Dahlia, one of the advantages of following Jonas and Dahlia is that really I could get up here and just shut up and not say anything. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I do have a few things, but I want to take a different approach to what, you know, actually everybody is, you know, um, taken to this point. And fly a little bit higher, talk maybe a little bit more impressionistically. It's about that time of evening, right? And actually do some storytelling. So I've devoted most of my career in one way or another to managing the environmental impacts of energy supply and use. We've mentioned EPA several times. I don't think I've heard anybody curse it yet. I actually did a lot of time at EPA as a Fed um, before joining faculty here at Duke. Um, and so I, you know, I've worked in this area in quite a while, for quite a while, and it's been very interesting over the last couple of decades or more to look at how the ways in which we think about managing the environmental impacts of energy supply and use has changed. And that's the story I want to tell. Again, sort of impressionistically, I'm going to go beyond electricity here. I'm not going to be as specific as the other speakers have been. Um, but again, you know, sort of a broad picture. Um, so energy environment, I mean, Dahlia said it well, Jonas reiterated it. You know, the two are, in, in, are inter, inextricably linked, right? You know, you think about greenhouse gases, well over half of anthropogenic greenhouse gases are due to energy in some form. Likewise, you know, vast majority of the pollutants that lead to smog, acid rain, um, are also tied to energy uh, generation or use. Um, over 40% of our water use, again, links back to energy, land use. And to flip it around, you know, remediating or mediating environmental problems requires energy. So the two are, two are linked. And it's really remarkable when you look back over the last maybe 45 years since the dawn of the modern environmental movement around 1970, the you know, Clean Air Act, Jonas mentioned that, you know, to think that a lot of the big visible problems that we were dealing with at the time are no longer big visible problems, at least in, in the US. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and it's actually even more remarkable when you look at what else has happened over that time. And you think that, you know, again, this is US, but our economy has grown more than doubled. Um, the number of miles we drive has increased a lot. It's actually, that's, that figure's down a little bit since the recession. It was higher in 2007, 2008, almost a doubling since 1970. You know, our population's gone up over 50%. And the amount of energy we use has increased as well. And despite all of that, to just pick one metric, you know, air emissions are down about two-thirds. Not CO2, but cr what we call criteria pollutants. The, the pollutants we were most worried about um, at the time. Um, and again, this is remarkable. You know, um, we depend, our health and well-being depend on clean air, clean water, functioning ecosystems, but also cheap, affordable, reliable energy, right? Well, one of the things I want to argue is that this, what you see there, you know, that, that reduction in air emissions, despite all the rest of this, has come about through a fairly narrow set of strategies. And we'll call this Energy Environment 1.0, for lack of a better term. Um, Namely, through the use of end-of-pipe control technologies um, like scrubbers on power plant stacks that you know, would uh, you know, avoid what you see there, um, or catalytic converters in automobiles that again have cut down certain um, emissions from tailpipes. We've also done things like phase out lead and gasoline. Um, and these strategies have been very, very effective, right? Um, but what I want to argue is that we're at a point now where even though these are still necessary, they're not going to be sufficient to go forward. Why? Well, there are a number of reasons. For one thing, population's grown. Um, you know, growing through most of the world. Um, and with that, you have the lifestyle expectations that come from rising affluence in many parts of the world, too. VMT, vehicle miles traveled, measure of transportation demand, projections for countries like China and India are tremendous. They've leveled off you know, in, in the US, but population is still growing. Um, but in other parts of the world, you know, you're looking at the likelihood of big increases. Um, and you know, with, with both of these, you know, both of these are pressures on demand for energy in some way. Um, and even though we'll continue to see increases in efficiency, this sort of thing outpaces that. 
And likewise, at the same time we're dealing with these pressures, we're also going to be trying to deal with climate change. Um, certainly focusing on mitigation of emissions, but also dealing with people's attempts to adapt to climate change. Um, so, you know, again, you know, if there are places in the world, and this is Beijing, where you, know, you still see this. So the question is, you know, what do you do? You know, how do you, what do you do to go beyond, again, this fairly narrow but effective set of strategies we've relied on to date that I want to argue, again, is no longer, you know, likely to be sufficient. Um, when I was with EPA, we had, there was a large discussion that started, oh, probably in the late 90s, um, about what the agency should be. Um, the agency is very constrained by the enabling pieces of legislation, like the Clean Air Act. Um, those pieces of legislation, you know, it, give EPA certain authority, but they also constrain it to act in certain ways. Um, looking forward, though, there was a recognition that the agency would have to approach things differently. Um, and that's where, again, where this idea of energy environment 2.0 comes from. You know, what is next after, you know, the strategies that we've relied on so long are no longer enough? One of the things that I want to argue is that we need to look broader, we need to take a broader perspective and think about larger system design um, questions. Um, but what I want to focus on here um, are not sort of specific design elements, but maybe cautionary tales that you know, remind us of just how difficult it is to anticipate what's coming. Um, you think about number of challenges. That would be my challenge number one. The, the, you know, the strategies we've relied on to deal with environmental impacts of energy supply and use are probably no longer adequate by themselves. Well, challenge number two, and Dolly has talked about this, Jonas has alluded to it, um, is that the energy system itself is undergoing a whole lot of change right now. If you were to go back about 100 years and stand in a power plant, look at a light bulb, look at the transmission grid, look at the engine under a, the hood of a car, they wouldn't look the same, but they'd look very familiar. There hasn't been a lot of change really until maybe the last decade, decade and a half or so. Um, but now we are at a point in time when we are starting to see a lot of change. Uh, we've gone from you know, energy systems that are characterized by centralized management to operation at a variety of scales. Not just decentralized, but operation at a variety of scales. You have systems that are being coupled, energy and agriculture, energy and transport, or electricity and transportation, electricity and IT, um, food production and energy, um, in ways that were not coupled before, which, you know, which introduces novel feedbacks, economic feedbacks and other feedbacks, but you also now are bringing new stakeholders into energy as well that haven't operated in that space before. So there are a number of challenges. You just give you a, you know, a couple of examples of what I mean. Think of vehicle fuels. You know, what do we do now? We take petroleum out of the ground. We process it at large scale refineries, um, distribute it locally. We have a very efficient system for doing that. Well, what might the future of transportation fuels look like? I'm not going to predict that, but it could operate at a variety of scales in ways that we're not familiar with. For instance, pick biofuels for, you know, as, as an example. It's very likely that you will see continued use of biofuels. Um, it's something that waxes and wanes. Um, but it's likely that you will see you know, a, a greater reliance on biofuels of some sort. What will that be? Not corn, I hope. Um, but what you probably see is a greater variety of regional feedstocks. So you use what's available, you use what grows in different areas. Um, and that may be processed in ways that we aren't used to processing transportation fuels. So for instance, this is switchgrass. Um, this was an, actually an experiment that I was help running. We have an intern stuck in the middle there someplace because none of us were brave enough to venture in the middle of that. Um, we had to give her a little bicycle flag to wave so we knew where she was. Um, beware internships. Uh, but no, you could take something like switchgrass and you could turn it into a bio oil via pyrolysis. And this is actually a mobile pyrolysis uh, unit. So you wheel it onto a farm field and suddenly you have a refinery in a farm field, and you're, then you're moving this bio oil, which looks like a synthetic crude, someplace else to be processed. You know, so now you've introduced industrial activity of a type into an area that you never saw it in before. You know, so it's just one way in which energy supply, energy production, may operate in ways that we're just, we haven't seen before. Take a different example. Self-driving cars, what might they mean for energy use? Well, they can mean a lot of things. You know, if you didn't have to own a car, but you always had something like this on demand, you pull out your phone, there's an app, it shows up, you know, shortly and takes you where you want to go. Well, you could picture denser urban living, 
But you could also picture the opposite. You know, intelligent vehicles like this operating would smooth out uh, traffic flow. Congestion wouldn't be as much of a problem. You could do other stuff as you're riding along to work, so people may not mind commuting as much, which could lead to increased sprawl as people move out. I'm not saying that's what would, ha would happen, but it's possible. You really don't know how a, a, a disruptive technology like this could affect how we live and in turn what that may mean for energy. So you know, you say, OK, you know, the, these broader sort of system design, this is what I mean by system design. It goes beyond just talking about electricity production to really how we live and how that influences how we supply and use energy. You know, they're hard to predict, and it's even harder to anticipate the consequences of that. So let me just tell a few stories, again, as a way of illustrating the, you know, some of this complexity. Um, so I'm going to talk about electric vehicles, but not that electric vehicle. I want to talk about that electric vehicle. OK, so we're back 100 years, right? We were there a little while ago, now we're back. Go you know, turn of the century, like 1900, not 2000. You would be forgiven at that point in time for looking at an electric vehicle, and that's what this is thinking that this is the future of automobility. At the time, electric vehicles and steam-powered cars each had about a 40% market share. Gas-powered cars um, had about a 20% market share. Gas-powered cars were noisy. They were dirty. Um, you also had to crank start them, which could be dangerous. It could be also dirty. It could be undignified. Um, people like Thomas Edison were looking at battery technology and making wild predictions about future developments. You had the streetcar electric grid in place at that point, so you had a source of power. Um, and again, you'd be forgiven for looking at, and you could talk about costs too, this was cheaper in many cases than uh, other vehicle types, for looking at something like this and saying, yeah, this is, what, this is how automobiles are going to develop. So what happened? Well, electric vehicles had a production peak in 1911 of about 30,000 vehicles a year. They hit their next production peak of about 50,000 vehicles in 2011, about a century later. So, you know, why? What happened? Well, a couple of things happened. One was technological, and that was the development of the, um, electric, or the electric starter for uh, or gasoline engines. So no longer did you have to sit and crank the thing with all its intended dangers and um, problems and embarrassments and whatnot. But you also had vast miscalculations on the part of the manufacturers of electric vehicles and steam-powered cars too, to a certain extent. They didn't see a consumer market developing for these vehicles, so they focused on fleets. They focused on sort of niche markets like the wealthy. Um, and it was um, Henry Ford then who came in with the Model T um, and had a very different business model, focusing on consumers realizing that the more cars he sold, the cheaper they'd be to produce, more people would be there to buy them. Um, and he cornered the market. And again, electric vehicles pretty much disappeared for almost 100 years. Um, so you know, I wouldn't count Elon Musk out. But the lesson here is that technology change itself is difficult to predict because it isn't just a matter of innovation or the best technology winning, taking market share. It's a, it can be business plans. Uh, consumer acceptance, or a lot of other factors that go into you know, making a technology successful, which is, again, why it's hard to predict what will happen. OK, you say. So you know, we're, we're thinking about you know, technology change in the future. We want to somehow guide that. And we certainly want to avoid surprises. So maybe if we can't predict exactly how technology is going to evolve and anticipate that and plan for that or encourage it, maybe we can at least anticipate some of its environmental consequences and mitigate those. OK, so story number two, back 100 plus years again. So our electric vehicle arrives home. This is her house up here, not down here. Um, and this is right about the time that cities were completing their water infrastructure. Um, so I'm not sure about these homes in front, but certainly our, our EV driver's home back here has electric water. And this is or electric, um, or not electric water, water supply for the first time, indoor plumbing is what I'm saying. Um, but where did the plumbing end? Well, the plumbing ended where it had ended previously, which is in the backyards, either in a privy vault or a cesspool of some sort. And it didn't take long for the powers that be in cities like this to begin to listen to the leaders of the sanitation movement and install sewer systems. So now where does the plumbing system end? Well, it usually ends in a local river or a water body nearby. So look at what we've done. We've taken what was a waste and a land use problem, and now we've turned it into a water problem. 
And the history of environmental management is actually full of examples like that. And when you treat environmental problems as single media problems, as air problems as air problems, water problems as water problems, waste problems as waste problems, and ignore those linkages, that's what you get. Um, now, it's not that people didn't see things coming. You know, oftentimes what you had then was somebody's discharge just up, down, upstream from somebody's water intake, you know, the next city. You know, so it's not that people didn't see that coming. You know, there are political reasons for not doing that. You know, why should I pay to treat my water when it's not going to benefit my constituents? Sound familiar? Um, and there were, you know, some scientific uncertainties too about how water would dilute pollutants. Germ theory was still developing. Um, so there are a number of things that, that came into play there. But again, you know, even anticipating the environmental impacts of what we do can be difficult. Okay, so we can't anticipate technology change necessarily. We can't even anticipate its consequences. Well, maybe we can talk about broad trends and you know get get a handle on those. Okay, so let's flash forward about 70 years, and you know we're we're in the 1970s at some point. You would be forgiven at that point for looking at past energy consumption. This is just economy-wide energy consumption in the U.S. Um, primary energy consumption, looking at past trends from the last couple decades and taking out your ruler and drawing a straight line into the future, um, and you get, you'd get something like that. And a lot of people did that. And folks in the environmental community and others concerned with resource um, consumption looked at that and said, oh my god, we're going to run out of resources by the turn of the century. You know, we're not going to have enough energy, enough whatever. What happened? Well, that's the actual trend. Um, Certainly not a linear extrapolation of the past, right? What happened in here? Well, you had a couple of oil shocks um, that really got people to focus on energy for the first time. Energy became expensive. And this is the rise of the environmental movement in there, too, was having an effect. Um, but it was primarily geopolitical shocks that, again, focused people's attention on energy and energy efficiency. Um, and that's what happened here. This is largely just improvements in energy efficiency. Um, that broke this trend. Did people anticipate that? No, not really. I could have, you, know, you can go back and look at all kinds of projections. I used to teach a modeling class, and we'd just for kicks go through a whole bunch of studies that were published about this time, and all their projections were just linear extrapolations like that. Very, very few people, in fact, almost no one saw anything like this occurring. Or if they did, they got it was for the wrong reasons. Okay. So is it hopeless? Um, you know, can't predict technology necessarily. Can't anticipate its consequences. We can't even get these broad trends right. Well, it's not that bad. Um, you know, there are people, people in this room who do really good work with decision making under uncertainty. Um, Google adaptive management, Google scenario analysis, and robust decision making. There are, there are a number of strategies we've developed for dealing with situations like this. Do we have a perfect crystal ball? No. But you know, there are ways of at least you know, anticipating some of this. But that's really not what I want to focus on in the couple of minutes I have left. You know, picking up what Steve said, I, I want to focus on opportunities. So a lot of you know, you know, presumably all of you are here because you're interested in energy. Um, and a lot of you are starting your energy careers, which is great. Well, there are my the opportunities I want to stress are twofold. The first one is that there are a lot of people on this campus that should also be here. Because energy is not just an engineering or an economic or even a legal and policy issue. Um, it is. It requires people who understand history, not to you know to take the past and project it into the future, but to understand why the future won't look like the past. Um, we need people. You know, I heard a, a Texas oilman on campus in March, speaking kitty corner across the intersection, who said, "What energy needs?" And this is a Texas oilman. What energy needs are more cultural anthropologists. And this was before dinner and wine. And I didn't know we had any to begin with. But he's right. And you know, what we need are people who can make these connections, connections between energy and food production, between transportation and electricity, again, between IT and all these things. And it's often those people who can make the connections that are the change agents. So opportunity number one, you know, there's, there is just opportunity in this space for people who you wouldn't normally think might be involved with energy. My second opportunity, and this is one sort of near and dear to my heart, because most of my, my, my interest in my teaching here somehow re, they revolve in one way or another around design of the built environment, large scale systems like transportation, urban planning, um, energy systems as well. 
um, and how they, all those things that impact energy. Um, so my opportunity number two is that really a lot of this is a design problem. It's a design challenge. It's not, you know, we, we, need, to be, we need to be concerned about what will happen. But, you know, there is, rather than saying what if and trying to predict, you know, we can also say how could. And that's a design question. How could we do this? You know, to take one example, um, again, this you know, of interest um, and staying with the, sort of the, the transportation theme here. Um, Looking at transportation and transportation energy use, to what extent are super efficient, low emission vehicles like this needed to, you know, to, to help transportation meet its share of emissions and energy reduction? And to what extent do we need to rely on urban planning solutions like compact growth, public transit, um, and things like that? With compact growth, how do you even quantify the greenhouse gas benefits of something like that? You know, there, there are a lot of interesting analytical as well as design questions that are inherent in that. Again, so you know, a couple of opportunities are one, you know, this is really for everybody. The second is that there is a real need to think creatively about where we are headed and how we might, might get there. So, thank you. <laughs>